Hi guys, welcome back to Waxing On. It's Monday, and that means jazz. Now, I was going through some of the old episodes when I was getting ready for the 200th episode a week or so ago, and noticed in episode 9, when I featured Miles Davis, I had said, well, I'll come back to him later, because there's so much uh, to talk about with Miles Davis. At that time, episode 9, I just covered three of my first Davis albums. So today I'm going to go back and we're going to look at what I consider one of my favorite periods of Miles Davis is the electric years. Now as you've been listening, if you're watching the show, I'm talking a lot about how jazz really got exciting in the 70s. Things really started changing up. We had all kinds of uh, players that were coming into it with jazz fusion. Rock was having an influence in, in jazz. It, it changed from the 40s to the 50s and 60s. 70s was something really exciting. And Miles was no different. I mean, he was leading the way. As often was the case, he seemed to be a little bit ahead of the trend. Um, some of it was hard to understand. A lot of times the critics and some of the public didn't really get it. And I was one of those. I mean, the first album I bought was uh, Miles at Fillmore. You may remember we talked about that. I'll just show you the cover here. This is a little CD cover. And having no context of the music or where it came from or what he was doing, this being my first exposure, I really had no idea what I was listening to. It sounded like you had a group of musicians all just improvising together and who knew what was going to turn out. Now, even though it was very hard to understand and hard for me to relate to, there was something special that really kind of connected with me and I still kept listening to it. At one point I was listening to the album with this stereo speakers. One speaker turned down that had a lot of the band on it and just listening to the trumpet side, uh, which maybe made a little more sense. And over the years, I, I mean, I still continue to listen. I still bought a lot of the material. 50 years later now, it makes a lot more sense. We've kind of, or I've kind of caught up to where he was 50 years ago, and I understand what's going on. So we're just going to take a look at some of the albums he produced during that electric period. And the first one I'm going to mention is the one that people say kind of kicked it all off. It was in a silent way. And you'll see at the bottom here, this showed up on a couple albums before that, Directions in Music by Miles Davis. Not just an album, he's taking us somewhere, he's giving us some education, he's taking us to a whole new place from where jazz had been before this time. And I mean, you look at the personnel on this album and it is just a, a who's who of jazz players that were popular in the 70s and really uh, coming into their own. You've got Herbie Hancock and Chick Corea both on electric piano. Wayne Shorter, tenor sax, Dave Holland on bass, uh, Joe Zolno, electric piano and organ, John McLaughlin on guitar and Tony Williams on drums. I mean, they all, the, I mean, Chick Corea, own band, just a great job. Herbie Hancock, Head to Headhunters. Um, Wayne Shorter and Joe Zolno, Weather Report. John McLaughlin, the Mahavishnu Orchestra, all these guys went off and became really successful and had all started with Miles Band here back, I'm going to say around 1969 this was. Now not a lot of music on here, there's two sides, I mean single disc and it's straight music. Side one was peaceful and side two in a silent way, it's about that time. And those songs were kind of connected together, they weren't separate tunes, so we really had a song on each side of the album. And that kind of led us into what Miles was doing over the next little while. Now, the next album, for me, again, we're back to Live at Fillmore. Just have, I had to write some notes down because there was just so much stuff going on here. Uh, I'm just going to just take a quick look and see what I had. Okay. No, I don't have it. The other one was the album. I, I, it's back in my other collection was Bitches Brew. That was the one that really came out and got things started before Live at Fillmore. And again, he had some great players on here, and this was really a landmark album. As much as uh, In a Silent Way was, Bitches Brew really was one that kind of took music to a whole different direction. And on that album, he had uh, similar personnel as what we had on In a Silent Way, but there were personnel changes that were happening under every song, and just too many to mention. A lot of times, if you go back into the, his discography on um, Wikipedia, they'll list the personnel, and on some of these albums, where he had a number of different songs. He had a different personnel maybe playing on each one. There may be a few players overlapping. And it's really amazing some of the names you see pop up in there. So that was one to take a look at. But 
Bitches Brew, definitely one of his landmark albums. Okay, next we come up into Miles at Fillmore, the one I had purchased originally. Recorded over four nights, Fillmore East, New York City. This was released in 1970. Live album. Now, we've had the first two. We had In Silent Way and Bitches Brew with studio albums. And as we found out later on, Tio Macero, the producer, controlled a lot of what actually came out on the studio albums. His editing, his uh, choice of how to put the music together, a lot of his influence are on those albums. When we get to the live albums, it's just Miles and the band. Now, on here, uh, again, four sides, Wednesday Miles, Thursday Miles, Friday Miles, Saturday Miles. I'm listening to it, I've got no idea what I'm going through. You know, the music's just way beyond me. Uh, Steve Grossman on sax, Chick Corea, Keith Jarrett's now on piano with him, Dave Holland on bass, uh, Jack DeJohnette on drums, and Erto on percussion. Great lineup, great bunch of players, and they're playing for about 30 minutes straight, no breaks, no talking. Now, what happened that really helped me out, and I'm back to the CD release, when it came out, they were having problems with these albums because um, they couldn't end up paying the composers because it was hard to tell where the songs were. And they had to go back and break these concerts down into songs so that the performing rights could be looked after. So when we got into that, they actually started listening to songs. So on Wednesday Miles, we got Directions by Joe Zolom. Bitches Brew, The Mask, It's About That Time, and The Theme. So there are definite songs in there. And once I started listening to those earlier albums, it was easier to recognize the tunes here, and it didn't sound so abstract. I mean, there were actually tunes they were playing that you could recognize. What really threw me for a loop, there's a couple here. We've got uh, I Fall in Love Too Easily by Julie Stein and Sammy Kahn. Can you imagine in the middle of all this stuff, we got that kind of traditional music he's throwing in there? Uh, we've got Sanctuary by Wayne Shorter, Willie Nelson and the theme. There's a lot of tunes that, by going back to, like say, Bitches Brew and uh, In a Silent Way, all of a sudden made sense now. And it really helped to have them divided into songs. And that was what CD release kind of kind of helped with, and that was all just to make sure everybody got paid. Okay, then we moved up to another one of my favorites that I talked about the first time, and I won't go over it a lot. It was the tribute to Jack Johnson, one of the most recognizable photos of Miles. Again, this was uh, strictly two sides of music, no breaks in the song. One, Side one was right off, and side two was yesternow. That was it. The band was uh, Herbie Hancock keyboards, John McLaughlin, Steve Grossman, Billy Cobham, who also went on to have a, a great career on his own with his band, but played with McLaughlin in Mahavishnu Orchestra as well, and Michael Henderson on Fender bass. So now we've incorporated the electric bass in there as well. Okay, we went from there to another live album. And again, this was a, a good run. I don't have it here in the pile. It was a live evil. And again, the advantage of the live albums are you get to hear what the band's really doing. You're not hearing what the producer's doing. You're hearing what the band's doing live. And live evil was recorded. Uh, they had some studio cuts as well as some uh, live concerts from the cellar door. Um, Gary Bartz is on sax. Other than that, it changes. There's a lot of different people. Oh, we're getting a call into the studio. Maybe it's a request. Let's find out. Can we put down a speaker? No. Hi. Oh. Nope. nope. Not going to be for me. Anyways, let's go on. A lot of different performers um, with the different cuts. So again, Wikipedia, look at the discography from Miles for Live Evil. You'll see all the players that are there, and it's just amazing some of the names that keep popping up. Okay, from that one, he went to one that really shook people up. It had a real mixed ri mixed review. Miles on the corner. Uh, no listing of who's on the band. Uh, we've got a number of different songs. He's broken them into songs this time. On the corner, New York Girl, thinking one thing, doing another. Vote for Miles, Black Satin, One and One, Helen Butte, and Freedom X. And again, kind of a gatefold uh, thing with a few cartoons, shot of Miles, but it was so different. As much as the other sounded unusual, On the Corner was very different. And critics didn't really accept it very well. Over the years, they have. They, I saw a review in Downbeat, the original one, really 
wasn't happy with it and kind of panned what they heard. A review a few years later, they really came around to appreciate what was going on in this album. And surprisingly, this is one I listen to quite often. It was another one of my favorites. And to show you how much, I guess, Teal Macero had to do with it and the music that was being made, they have released the, the complete Jack Johnson and the complete On the Corner uh, albums. There was a lot of material to cull through and pull out uh, two sides of music. And I was listening to On the Corner of the Complete Session the other day, and boy, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Now, granted, it sounds a lot like the band came in. They just start playing stuff, and all of a sudden they say, okay, there's a nice theme there. We'll cut that make that a song. Maybe that's what Tio did. But some good stuff on there as well. And just to give you some idea of who's playing on that album, uh, Al Foster has now joined him on drums along with Billy Hart. We got Carlos Garnett and Dave Liebman on saxophone. Uh, Trickery and Hancock are still there. And five guitar players, still including John McLaughlin. So you can tell really heavy on the rock influences. Uh, we got, you know, like say saxes and trumpet. And now it miles into electric trumpet. So I mean, it's really modified and uh, some wah wah in there and a whole different sound. You've got to hear it to believe it. The next album that I have, and I don't have my copy of uh, In Concert, the one they did at Philharmonic Hall. I had that on 8-track. Again, just some of the same tunes he's playing in this era, but the live version. So the next album, the last two that I picked up in that 70s era, and again, two classics, Miles Davis, Get Up With It, Four Cider, and we've got... Uh, Gosh, songs recorded from 1970 to 74. So again, it was not really a greatest hits album. It's a compilation of things that hadn't been released before that he pulled out and, and did. We've got one side here, just a tribute to uh, Duke Ellington called He Loved Him Madly. And to give you some idea of who's playing on here, we've got Liebman still here, Foster's there, Pete Cozy on drums, Michael Henderson's back in, Sonny Fortune, Steve Grossman, Billy Cobham. Depending on the album, cut... A lot of the players we've heard from before because we're running from 70 to 74 it's a whole gamut of the 70s at this point and a lot of great tunes uh, again two sides uh, one side being he loved him madly and then uh, a couple of the, well actually got four sides in here I guess we got a long one so a four sider miles get up with it and the last album he released uh, before he re early retirement was a live album from Japan called Akarta And on this one, let's see what we've got for the band. Uh, Sonny Fortune, saxophones, Michael Henderson, bass, Pete Cozy, Al Foster, Reggie Lucas, guitar, Latum on uh, various percussion. Recorded at the Osaka Festival Hall, Japan, February 1st, 1975. Now, what had happened with this one? There's actually this album and a second album that was recorded in the evening concert. This was the afternoon one. And some argue the evening concert was better than this one. And the band, it changes. I mean, every time you play, certain things influence your performances. Columbia didn't release the other album in North America. It was released in Japan. But nowadays, you can go back, and even with these albums, I'm on one of the streaming networks. I don't want to specify which one because I'm not trying to promote one over the other. But... The second set of this, the evening concerts on there, we've got a number of versions of Live at Fillmore West as opposed to Fillmore East. We've got a lot of music that was happening during the same period where live albums were produced but really weren't released in the stage that Columbia was doing at the time. So they weren't in with what, what I had purchased. But if you go online and take a look, there's a lot of options. A lot of, And even if you're listening to live albums, they may be the same song, but... It's never the same way twice. It's going to be something different in there. And to me, this was some of what I found to be Miles' best music. I mean, you gotta remember the time. I mean, here I am, a teenager coming in, rock music's big. I've grown up on rock and roll, but I grew up on that, you know, verse, verse, chorus, verse, throwing a bridge once in a while kind of rock, and all of a sudden I'm hearing this stuff. And while I didn't know what I was hearing, I couldn't turn away from it. And again, 50 years later, this is still just as vibrant, just as exciting, just as interesting of music is what it was then. It doesn't sound dated to me. It still challenges me when I listen to it, and it just shows, again, how far Miles was ahead of what was going on at the times. 70s, 
great time for jazz. Okay, that's it for today. Just looking at the electric miles. If you haven't checked it out, keep an open mind. There's lots out there to listen to, and I think you'll be surprised. Okay, and that's it. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thanks for stopping by. Take care.